So uh, tell me, give me a minute or so, Bruce, on what it's been like taking, actually you were the only employee the first time we met. You were the founding dean, correct? That's correct. And I said to you, uh, you really were operating with a clean sheet of paper. There was you and virtually nothing. That's so right. give us a minute about what this past two and a half years has been like. It has been the most fun I have had in my entire academic career, which now I've been in academic medicine for over 30 years, and the last two and a half years have just been absolutely spectacular. Uh, November 1st, 2010, I was the only employee of the School of Medicine. Today we're up over 70 full-time wow, employees. Wow, impressive. 22 uh, basic science faculty and then uh, a large number of staff. And we've really been fortunate in that to, me to meet our deadline of having classes start in the fall, everything had to work. Right. And it did because the entire university from the Board of Trustees down to facilities management have been pulling in the same direction. Mm -hmm. And when problems arose, everyone applied themselves to that. And so we're able to hit our deadline because of teamwork. You know, I tell you what, normally when I would hear those words, I would say, well, I hear what he's saying, right? But the reality of it is you, could, you really could not have done what you have done without the teamwork and without the support of the university in general and the, and the staff, et cetera. Now, among the, all the people that you've hired, that's clinical staff, that's doctors? No, no. no. those are full-time paid employees. We have over 200 physicians in the community who are faculty within the School of Medicine. Oh, okay, and don't you have, you have affiliations with other hospitals? We to, do. Who, uh, who St. Vincent's hospitals? Medical Center in Bridgeport is our principal clinical partner which means that the chairs of the clinical departments at that hospital are the chairs of the clinical departments in the School of Medicine. I see, okay. Then we also have affiliations with um, Mid-State Medical Center, mm -hmm. uh, Middlesex Hospital, Hartford Hospital, um, Jewish Home in Fairfield, which is a skilled nursing facility, mm -hmm. and I just finished negotiating an affiliation with Waterbury Hospital, but we haven't actually signed the agreement well, yet. So actually what, what happens is that, and you correct me if I'm wrong, Bruce, is, is the students are going through your medical school, they've got to go somewhere to quote unquote practice, or what, what's the right word? They need a uh, practical experience in interacting with patients. So. Part of that occurs in the hospital, but a big part of it occurs outside of the hospital. Right. And one of the, I think, uh, unique components of our curriculum is what we call our medical student home. And beginning in the first year, students are paired with a primary care physician in the community, and they will go to that physician's office one afternoon a week for three years and see patients together with that physician. Oh, it's a, it's a, a mentorship. It's for a mentorship, and we hope that that mentorship uh, causes as many students as possible to choose careers in primary care. Well, I think the other thing too, uh, Bruce, that it does is at a very early stage of their academic career, it gives them, it brings them into the real world right away. That's right. Yeah, and, and that makes a major difference. So the, you had mentioned primary care. I remember you indicating that as part of the founding of the medical school, that the primary areas of interest were going to be primary care and global health care, and there's been a new one that you've added, but let's talk about the primary and the global first. So, uh, with the, uh, if you look at the health care system, there is a growing physician shortage, and the greatest segment of that shortage is in the primary care mm -hmm. disciplines of family medicine, general pediatrics, and general internal medicine. Mm -hmm. So we set that early on as something we thought we could meaningfully uh, impact. We also know that uh, the world's getting smaller and spread of disease and all of that can occur in a matter of hours with air travel. So uh, healthcare is becoming global and the best way to impact overall global health is from a public health perspective. So that's why we've placed the focus on global public health. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. We're, Excuse me for interrupting. When you mentioned air travel, wasn't that how that, what was the name of that uh, virus, uh, uh, SARS? SARS. The, the, they that they suspected that that came from China? Is that uh, what it was? That's my recollection, okay. yes. Okay. And so the way we're beginning to organize the School of Medicine is to have uh, three areas of excellence, if you will. Uh, primary care, 
the global public mm -hmm. health, and then, um, and I'll explain the, the third one in a minute, uh, veterans rehabilitative medicine. And so we will be building three institutes, and an institute for primary care, institute for global public health, and an institute for veterans rehabilitative medicine. The veterans component really came about because of the incredible strengths in the physical therapy and occupational therapy programs that exist at Quinnipiac. And have been very strong for a long for time. For a very long, long time. time. Very highly recommended. And so we uh, want to bring those resources together with resources in the medical school, um, collaborate with some uh, facilities uh, such as Gaylord mm -hmm. uh, and also the, the VA and provide we think uh, a real opportunity to help the wounded warriors that are coming back to this country. Well, uh, number one, I applaud the effort. Uh, and I would guess, Bruce, as an outsider looking in, not as a medical person, but as a person who follows the news quite, especially veterans uh, work, as I do a lot of work with veterans groups. I mean, the reality of it is, and I don't think I'm being unkind when I say that, the care that's being given to the veterans on a United States of America basis I mean, all we read is fiasco after fiasco after fiasco of the delivering of what is care that is owed them. So you're going to step into that breach and, and you believe you can mitigate it, huh? We, we believe we can mitigate it. Uh, we won't, we as the uh, university won't be providing direct care. That's why we will have our partnerships okay. with the facilities like Gaylord and right. the veterans. But we think we can bring an academic and research focus to this and get better outcomes mm -hmm. for the injuries that these uh, men will and women. Will you have to partner with the federal government to do that, Bruce? Um, we will partner with whoever makes sense to get where we think we need to go. <laughs> We're not particularly. Very diplomatically stated, Bruce. Very, okay, let's move on to the next topic. The next topic is um, you are in the unique position, Bruce, in opening up the medical school of, and how, how many Students coming in, did you say? We'll have 60 in our charter class. 60, that's this September coming uh, in. Uh, August 12th. And August 12th, 60 of them come in. And among the 60, I mean, is there an allocation toward primary care versus the uh, global public health care? Uh, we know just through the application process that uh, a little over half Mm -hmm. expressed a strong interest in primary care. Others were undecided at this point mm -hmm. what specialty, if you will, of medicine. Uh, some were there because of their interest in global health. Mm -hmm. And uh, quite honestly, I think a number of them are there because of the excitement of being the first class oh, yeah, of a brand I'm new sure, medical I'm sure school. That, yeah, I, I'm absolutely sure that that's part of it. Bruce, let me ask you a question about the primary care doctor before we move on. Sure. I mean. There are thousands and thousands and thousands of shortages in the primary care area, as you indicated before. Right. And this has been going on for quite some time. Uh, I mean, when you ask the question, why is that? Uh, from what I read, once again, as a layperson, the answer that I get is, if you're a young man or woman that's gonna become a doctor, right? And you're gonna decide bet between becoming an orthopedic person or a neuro person or a whatever person, versus the primary care physician, the family practice medicine, that you're making a decision that from an income point of view, from an income point of view, um, there's almost like no comparison. Now I'm firing a bit for, for effect, but how are you gonna overcome when they look out there and they see the neurosurgeon making, I don't know, quarter million dollars or more, and maybe their potential is 150? So some- Is that, is that still a real? Oh, that uh, definitely the dispar not disparity isn't the right word. The the spread of income mm -hmm. uh, earning potential across specialties in medicine mm -hmm. is vast. Mm -hmm.